Turn with me this morning to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians. In our text um, this morning and evening will be coming from verses 3 through 11 of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, but I'll, I'll begin by reading Um, Verses 1 through 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in in all Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted, are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, It is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yea, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift gift granted to us through many. Thus ends our reign. Let's ask God's blessing on his word. Father, again, having read your holy, infallible, and inspired word, a word that has great power and and, and great uh, light and insight, but yet a word, Lord, that we cannot understand, a word that will not take root in us, except that your Holy Spirit works it into our hearts and minds. Father, be with my mouth and bring forth exactly the word it is that you desire, uh, and that you would be with each one here present, each one listening, that you would strengthen, encourage through your word and spirit. And again, Father, we pray for those that do not yet know you as Lord and Savior, have mercy and open their hearts while there is yet time. All these things we ask in Jesus' name alone. Amen. Augustine or Augustine, I guess you can say it either way, uh, the fourth century Uh, Saint was a philosopher before he was a Christian um, and just a brilliant man. In fact, we just read recently somewhere that he wrote so much stuff it still hasn't been all translated to this day. And I mean, this guy wrote, he just was a brilliant, brilliant guy. And what that means is he was one of those blessed individuals that had something to say about everything. And one of the things that he had to say something about was time. And he had kind of a a funny thing about expressing this. He says, what then is time? If no one asks me, I know what it is. However, if I wish to explain it to someone who asks me, I do not know. And and I think that is a, a, a marvelous insight. Because time is a mysterious thing. Um, We all think that we know what it is, but if you really stop and think about time, it is a strange beast indeed. Um, I've studied it a little bit. There's a physics teacher out in Southern California. He's well known, and he's he's got a whole lecture on time. And I've watched about half of them. And he says from a physics standpoint, time does not make sense. It is a mystery to the scientists um, today. They do not understand because time is very strange. It, it, only want, it only seems to run in one direction. And that's a marvelous thing when you think about it. And you also think about this idea of time, that all the animals have a time of their life. All the creatures, every living creature has a certain time 
um, that they live. Some, they only live for minutes. Some, they live for a couple of days. But there's no creature except for man who cares about time. And there's a reason for that. We know just a few things as Christians from the Word of God, this about time. We know that time is a commodity. It is a precious, precious commodity. We know that we only have so much of it. And we know that we're going to be judged for what we did with that commodity, what we did with that time. And that's exactly why it's necessary to look back. It's good to look back in your life from time to time. It is not good to dwell on the past. It's not good to live in the past. But it is good to look back in the past, kind of just think about where I've been and where is it that I'm going. Because we only have so much time. What have I done with it so far? You know, how do I measure the time that I have? And how do I use what I know from the past to help me in the future? And so when I think about looking back, because to me it's an interesting subject, because it's one of those things that if God happens to give you more time than you ever thought you might have, you know, when I was younger, I, I never thought about time. I just didn't even care about the past, didn't think about the past. I just was pointed to the future. Now, I don't even know why. I'm just going forwards. I'm not going backwards. But now I see that it's good to look back think about your life and to think about what God is doing in your life. And so when we stand here on January 1, 2023, we look back to the past. And not for long, how did your year look? Have you thought about that? When you look back at 2022, how does it measure up? What did you experience in 2022? I, I imagine that there were a minority of people that, for them, 2022 was a home run, knocked it out of the park. Something amazing happened to them, changed their lives. It was an awesome year. I imagine the, the, the greatest part of us would probably say, well, you know, without deep thinking, we would just say, well, it was an average year. It was an okay year. It wasn't nothing, it wasn't, it wasn't anything special, you know. It wasn't that bad. It was, it was okay. And then there are those that look back and say, it was a hard year. It was a difficult year. And this text grabbed me because of that idea. Because it's an idea, this text seems to me to speak to everybody. And I wanted to just kind of do a meditation at first when we're, we'll kind of work our way into the text. But the, what grabbed me about this text, and, and this letter that, that, that Paul writes to the, to the uh, Corinthians here, um, it's not his usual letter, and it certainly isn't his usual opening of a letter. Many of his letters have a certain kind of uh, style when he, when he begins. And, and verse 3 right here makes it unique. There's no other book that opens this way. He begins with this very unique thought, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. For me, that, that word blessed, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. To me, that seems to be an amazing thought if we stop and just think about it. Blessed. And, and the word blessed there in, in, the, in, in the Greek is... Uh, it means worthy of all praise, worthy of all thankfulness. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is worthy of all our blessing. And one of the things we need to do when we look back, I don't care if your year was out of the park. I don't care if you think it was average or if it was even a very difficult year. One thing we should all experience when we sit here this morning, January 1, as we look back at 2022, is we should be able to say, as the children of God in Christ, blessed be God. Blessed be 
the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. Every one of us should be able to look back and say, you know what? I take way too much for granted. I take way too much for granted. You know what? At first glance, when I look back at it as, a, as, a, as an American, okay, maybe it was an average year, but if I look back at it as a believer, and I look back at the fact that God has fed me and clothed me and cared for me, I, I look at my own family. At first, when I, when I ask myself, how was your year? I'm looking and I'm thinking, eh, nothing stands out, right? It's just, ah, whatever, right? But then you stop and you actually think, whoa, wait a second. We had some grandchildren that were born this year. We have a daughter that was married this year. And then you start just kind of looking down into it. You look at our own congregation. God added some families to, to, to our congregation this year. Added some children to our congregation this year. And you start to think about those things. And in our flesh, we're so foolish. We just don't even think about how good those things are. We just take so much for granted. And, I, I know, and you probably heard that in my prayer too, but that's what's on my heart and mind, is that we don't think about the God who upholds and keeps everything going in this world. You know, you think about all the different systems that, that keep this world living and vital. Uh, in, in, in Job, one of the writers, you know, inspired by the Spirit of God, said if God were to... Take his, whole, take his spirit from all the earth. He said, everyone, everything would die and turn to dust. If God were to pull his spirit, because only God gives life. To, the, to this day, all these brilliant people that deny God boldly and loudly and speak of their own wisdom, not one of them can make a bacteria come to life much less a human being. They can't create a dog. They, they can't make a fish. They can't do any of this, but God did it. He created that. But, and then he created this system. You, know, you think about how farmers plant their, their fields every year. And, and most of us don't know this, and some of us do a little bit, and some of us know more, and I'm one of the ones that knows less. But, but if you took a cup full of that soil and you put it under a microscope, what you would find is there's life in there. And you could get microscopes that go smaller and smaller, and you continue to see organisms that are smaller and smaller, that are just teeming in that earth, in that ground. And it's those, all these living organisms, and billions and trillions of them um, per acre, that are help make that soil fruitful. Think about photosynthesis, right? Fancy word. And as I looked it up again and started to think about the science of it, right? Because I used to think that was really cool. Now I look at it and I'm like, oh man, I didn't realize, right? And the, one of the simple ways of saying it, photosynthesis turns light energy into chemical energy. Now what does that mean? I don't know. I'm not going to go into it, but, but I am going to say this. It's that all these green plants and all this green stuff, living stuff all over the earth, that takes the light and the energy from the sun, and one of the byproducts is oxygen. Maintains our whole atmosphere. If you get rid of photosynthesis, boom, life is done on Earth. One little thing. And our whole environment, our whole uh, biological sphere is filled with this. It's everywhere. There are so many things, Just I refer to it in, my, in the prayer, but you think about the, what they call the autonomic systems in the, in, the, in the human body, not just the human body, but all living creatures. God has set in place these autonomic systems that there are systems that are running in us full time, 24 hours a day, and they don't ever stop. And without them, if you had to think consciously about to take your next breath, how long would you live? If you had to be awake to take that next breath, how long could you survive, right? Think about it, because, wow, if I go to sleep, I'm going to stop breathing, so I can't go to sleep. How long are you going to live without sleep, right? That's just one tiny little thing. 
And, and your body's filled with system after system after system. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Now, notice something else in that text. Notice, blessed be the God and Father, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. Notice that those two words are repeated, but in opposite um, they're placed oppositely on each side. God, Father, Father, God. There's a reason that he does that. That's actually not an accident. There's meaning to that. It's an arrow, and it's pointing to the center. And the center is our Lord Jesus Christ. And what, what Paul is saying, very simply, by constructing the sentence that way, he's saying this God this Father, this Father of mercies, this God of all comfort, we know him that way only because of Jesus Christ. We know him as Father of mercies. And notice the word mercies. It's a plural. It's not a singular mercy, right? Because mercy can speak of, of compassion, pity, right? You look at someone and they're in a bad situation, um, that's one of the main words that's used for mercy. But, it, but if you go through the Word of God, you'll find all kinds of different mercies. Traveling mercies, healing mercies, mercies of love, mercies of faithfulness, right? There's all these different mercies, and God is the Father of mercies. And He's the, and he's the God of all comfort. Do you know what that means? That means that He is the, the source of it. It's not saying that God is merciful. It's not saying that, that he's comforting or encouraging. It's saying that that is his nature. That is who he is. That is what he is. He is the father of mercies. And mercies just flow out of him. And the God of all comfort. Think about that too. Notice that. That means that no matter what your situation, he can comfort you. There is no situation in human life that God cannot encourage and bring comfort to. There's no set of circumstances that God says, ah, oh, I can't deal with that one. It's every circumstance. And, and this is why this, this, this grabbed me, is because as we, look at, as we look at the past, it does not matter who we are or what kind of year we've had this past year. We should all be able to say blessed. And as we start this new year, we should be able to look back and say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we get into this text, I was trying to find a simple way to break it down, but I think it's, it's more complex than that. And so I ask you to be a little patient with me in some of the wording, perhaps. But how do we come to know this God? This God who is the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort? We have to suffer. And that's what I liked about this text, because it speaks to those who are among us who have suffered. You need to hear that. You need to hear what this God is about. You need to be reminded of the benefit of the hard things that you've gone through. But also looking ahead this coming year, for Christians, the question is never if we're going to suffer if we're going to have tribulation, if we're going to be afflicted. That's not the question, because the question in, in the word of God, from, almost from the beginning, God tells us you're going to suffer. You're going to be afflicted. You're going to be, you're going to have times of tribulation. So it's not a matter of if, it's when. And when I look ahead in this coming year, I, I don't see a set of circumstances where everybody's going to somehow pop out and everything's going to be just great 
and nobody's going to suffer. I actually think that there are people that suffered this past year. There will be another set of people that will suffer this coming year. So what is the benefit of that? And this is what's so beautiful, because the Apostle Paul, and I'm going to tell a little bit more of the story tonight. I'm not going to spend much time on telling kind of the, what he's gone through. But the Apostle Paul has come through to just an amazing insight, a deep, deep insight that he himself has experienced. And now he's sharing it. And he's sharing it with the Corinthians. He's sharing it with us. And he's telling us something about the, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. How do we come to know him in that way? How do we come to know that there is a God that is with us no matter what our situation is? We come to know him through this suffering, through this tribulation, right? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforts us. You don't need a God of all comfort if everything's great in your life, if everything's just dandy, if everything's just going swimmingly, if the ball is always bouncing your way. And it seems like there are people out there that that seems to be their life. Those people are not going to know this God. They are not going to know the God of all comfort because the God of all comfort is the one who comes to those that need comfort. So you have to experience tribulation to find this out about our God who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now I want us to notice a couple of things about what he's saying here. The first thing he seems to be saying is that there's a purpose for our suffering. There's a purpose for our tribulation. The, the word tribulation here and the word trouble, same in the, in the same verse here, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able, to, be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. It's the same word, and in, in, in the Greek it's this word thalipsis. And, and thalipsis means to be pressed, to have pressure. And even like I, you know, we, we looked at Psalm 32, right? Your hand was heavy upon me, you know? Uh, day and night your hand was heavy upon me. And when you get into trouble, when you get into tribulations, the net effect is that you start to feel this, this crushing of your heart, your mind, your soul, not just your body, who comforts us in all our tribulations that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. So what he seems to be saying is that the benefit of coming to know God through trouble and through tribulation, there's a, there's a reason for that. And brothers and sisters, I find this to be incredibly meaningful and significant, and it's something that in some way we probably know or understand, but on a daily basis, we, we don't really grab a hold of it. We don't understand that God does things to us to make it so that we can be part of his comfort down the road for someone else. We always have this tendency to just look at ourselves, right? Well, I'm not a preacher. I'm not an elder. I'm not called to this or that, right? Well, when God puts you into situations, hard things happen, and, they, and hard things are hard things. There's no, there's no theology in the Word of God from the beginning to the end that you're supposed to, if you know your theology right, then, then even your hard times, you'll be able to say, ah, oh, this is awesome, this is great. That is not the Word of God. You don't theologize yourself out of not experiencing suffering and affliction. A hard time is a hard time. But in it, there's a purpose. And the purpose is that you might be able to comfort others. I think about AA. Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a pretty good program. And I won't go into detail. I don't know enough about it. I know enough to, 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 to take this illustration. If you go to AA, and maybe you're being sent by the state or the judge because you got caught for drinking or whatever, and so you get sent, and so you go. Maybe you finally wake up one day and say, I need to do something different than what I've been doing. 
And again, that's the grace of God. So you come to this place and you sit there and, and there's a group of people, men and women, in all different stages. Some of them haven't taken a drink for 10 years, for 15 years, for 20 years. Some of them haven't taken a drink for a day. Right? And if you decide to stay and to get help, at some point, I don't know if you ask or you'll be assigned a sponsor. And a sponsor is somebody that knows exactly what you're going through. They are somebody that has drunk themselves to the very bottom of their existence and finally they had to get out or die. There's someone that knows exactly what it means to be a drunk. And you can call that person day or night. You can be there at two o'clock in the morning giving them a call. I'm in my car. And all I can think about is going down to the, the store. And what are they going to do? Are they going to scream and yell at you theology? No. They're going to come alongside you. And they're going to say, we've been there. I know exactly how you feel. And they're going to come right next to you with that. Now you think that that doesn't matter. I think we must think it doesn't matter because many of us, we get sick. We never think to ourselves, God is bringing me through this sickness so that I might help someone else. And brothers and sisters, one of the keys to getting out of this is to realize that there's purpose in it. There's purpose in your sickness. And that's the crazy thing, right? Because the Christian says... And, and this, for the unbeliever, is pretty hard for the unbeliever. He's saying, wait a second. X amount of people get cancer and get really sick every year. But you're going to say that for you, there's a purpose. It seems pretty random to me. Well, for the ungodly, it is random. In fact, all of life is random for them. Right? Photosynthesis is random for them. Right? The food that they have every day, that's random for them. But it's not random for us. We believe in a God that is with us at all times. And he's telling you and me in the word of God that whatever trouble I'm going through right now is for a purpose. And that purpose is to help someone else. That's amazing. But it makes sense, right? Love God, love your neighbor. How can I love my neighbor? I have to come alongside my neighbor when they need help and where they need help. So what can you share with that person? Well, what can you learn when you're going through this? Look at, look at what it says here in verse 5. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Two things there. One, there seems to be an equation that as deep as your sufferings are, so great shall be the consolations. In other words, it's going to come, it's gonna, God's going fill to that, fill that valley of suffering with a mountain of consolation. Now, how does he do that? Again, this is why I believe the Word of God is so important, because it helps us to see and understand things we did not see and did not understand. If I turn to God in faith and I say, God, I know that whatever, I'm, whatever trouble, whatever grief I'm going through right now has a purpose, so that I might be used to comfort someone else, then help me to see and make sense of what I'm going through right now. He uses the word, the sufferings of Christ. Now, what does that mean? Well, you think about it. If you've lost someone, if you've experienced great loss in your family, you've lost a child, you're sick, you've lost a job, divorce, you've lost a husband or a wife, they've said, I'm done, and they leave, and you leave, and they leave you empty. How, how do I know 
that God is with me here. Because what happens? Well, what happens, brothers and sisters, almost all suffering has certain elements to it. And I don't have a, a nice list or anything today, but one of, these, one of these elements is loneliness. When you and I are suffering, we feel alone. Right? You think about somebody that has a high fever. You got 102, 103 fever, and you're sitting on a couch, and they're having a party three feet away from you. And all these people are there, and they're laughing, and they're happy, and they're joking, and everything's good. Not you. There's a bubble over you. You can feel it. You are separated. They, they could be 100 miles away. They could be 300 miles away. They, they could be a million miles away. It doesn't matter because where you are and where they are is a completely different place. You are in misery. You're hurting so bad, you can't even think about anything outside that bubble. You can hear the laughing. You can hear the, 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 the talking. And you're thinking to yourself, man, that would be marvelous if I could join in. But I can't because I'm in this, in this misery. I'm alone. So we feel alone. But it's more than that. We feel unloved. When we're hurting, it feels like God has left us. It's like he's not here. Wherever he is, it's a long ways away from me. He's, near, he's not near unto me right now. We feel rejected. We feel dejected. we basically feel like we're disappearing. When you are really suffering, you feel like you're just disappearing into nothing. You're, you're nobody. You're nothing. How do I even matter to my family? How do I matter to the world? How do I matter to this church? Whatever. The bottom line is, you feel like you're just disappearing. What does that have to do with Jesus? Jesus. That's what Jesus went through for you and me. Particularly on the cross, but before the cross too, but particularly on the cross and particularly those three hours of darkness. In that three hours of darkness, it felt as if God, the Father, his Father, abandoned him. He was abandoned of all men, And he was abandoned of the Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt like nothing, no one. I don't matter. What if I die and I don't come to life? He was a human being. And those same things that you feel when you're really sick, because it's hard to be sick. It's hard to be sick for 24 hours much less weeks and months. And every day you wake up feeling miserable. And every day you're beginning to think to yourself, I'd be better off dead than alive. It is, and your heart and soul can go to bad places when you're sick. They can go to bad places when you've experienced great loss. The word of God is telling us, set your eye on Jesus and understand something. He's been there. He knows exactly how you're feeling. He has experienced. He doesn't come alongside and say, hey, don't do that. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Don't, uh, you know, he comes alongside and he actually says to you, I've been there. I know what it feels like to be empty. I know what it feels like to become and, and to feel as if you're nothing and no one and you don't matter. I know what it feels like to experience pain that you think will never stop. I know what it feels like to feel like your father has turned his back and hate you. And now I'm here to tell you, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I've got you. 
But that doesn't come except that your eye turns off and says, God, why? Well, here's the word of God telling us why. I've got a purpose for your suffering. I've got a purpose for your pain. You know, a lot of people experience sickness. So there's a lot of people that think, okay, well, you know, I could actually look at that and see, well, for sickness, I guess that makes sense. But what about losing a child? Seems like not a lot of people lose child. Well, let me tell you something. If you lose one, you're going to find out that there's a lot more people out there that have lost a child. God's got a purpose for your pain. He's got a purpose for your suffering. And that purpose is first to know him better and to know that he is there with you. He's not going to let you go. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He's going to bring you out of it. And he's going to give you a testimony. He's going to give you something to say to someone. Which is why the Apostle Paul, in the end, says, I would rather rejoice in my sufferings. Because he knows that it's through his suffering, and we'll talk about that tonight, about what that really meant. He knows that through this suffering, I'm actually able to talk to people. I'm actually able to comfort people. I'm actually able to encourage and strengthen people in a way that I wasn't before. And I'll just end with this example. I've been thinking a lot about rest homes. And I don't mean for this to be taken as judgment on anybody, just, but just hear what I say about rest homes. Rest homes are not easy places. There's a small minority of people like Paul Liefers. God bless him. He was, his wife died years before he needed to go to a rest home and and, but he was at home alone by himself all the time. He had some friends. He would go out with his son and, and eat breakfast every day. And, and, and there were different things that he did. But he was alone most of the time. He's at a rest home now. He loves it. He goes, these people take such good care of me. And he's always smiling. And he's always kind of going around. And, and, and he actually lifts the whole mood of that place because he's one of those guys that Whoever your problem is, he's going to come and he's going to have a smile on his face. He's going to say hi, etc. But I've experienced so many that it's the opposite. So many people go into rest homes, and I, and I beg you to visit a rest home, to visit somebody you know in a rest home. And, and I beg of you to do it, because the more that you see it, the more that you're going to know. You might end up there. You might end up there. None of us think we're going to end up there. And almost everybody in a rest home never thought they were going to end up in a rest home, okay? But they do. And you're going to find out that is a difficult place. There's a ministry there, right? Because you come in and you feel just like I just described and explained. You're alone. You don't matter. Nobody cares about me. Almost all the people in a rest home have had that feeling. They feel rejected. And they are so lonely. And we come and we visit for a little bit. And we think we've done something. But then we walk away. And I remember when I was a kid in the hospital. And I was in the hospital for a few weeks. And people would come and visit me. And then they would leave. And the moment they left, it just made it all the emptier. So think about it if you're in a rest home. And you have a word like this. God's got me here. I'm suffering. But I'm suffering for a purpose. So you think about somebody in a rest home that has a word like this on their heart and mind, and they come to see that all, these lon all this loneliness that they have experienced, all these tears they have wept, that everybody that's coming in that door today that's a new one, they're experiencing all that. And now God has brought me through it and I know that he's with me and that he loves me. And I'm not lonely like I was. Now I can go and talk to that person that's just coming in. Because I promise you, 
You know, I've talked to these people. Just recently, one of them was telling me, and there's a lady that came in right across the hall from her, and she can hear her crying half the day. I said, well, go talk to her. You know, at the end of the book of Job, Job is forgiven, and, and Job is exalted. And then God goes to his friends, you guys have ticked me off. And you need to go talk to Job so that he can pray for you. And I find that an amazing thing because after Job prayed for them, everything in Job's life has started to come back. That's when it talks about his new children and how everybody came to see him and to comfort him when he turned and prayed for someone else, even in that darkness. He said, I'll pray for my friends. God's got a purpose for pain and for suffering. And I pray that that would be a comfort to those who have had a very difficult year this year. And I pray it would also give us a heart and a mind to look at our own lives and to look at how we look at hard things. And that maybe perhaps we'll be like the Apostle Paul someday that we would say, I will glorify in my suffering. Amen. Father, once again, we come before you this morning and thank you so much for your word. Your word which instructs us and teaches us. But Father, we know too that it's useless if we do not hear it. Hear it with our soul. Hear it with your spirit in us, telling us these are good words. These are words of life. These are words of power. These are words of change. These are the words that that, that can, can turn our life around. Lord, we were made to serve. We were created to serve you, to praise, to exalt, and to glorify you, and to love and to care for our neighbor. And we pray that you continue to teach us and strengthen us and encourage us in your word that we would hear, that we, even as Jesus said, he has an ear to hear, let him hear. Let us hear, Father, let us hear. Let us not continue to think that, that our pain, our affliction, the things that we suffer have no purpose, for they have great purpose so that we might become more effective comforters, more effective carers for others. Lord, blessed be your holy name above every other name. All these things we ask in Jesus' name alone. Amen.